Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome you to the Virtual Visma Dialogue Online Procedure. My name is Camila Simão. I'm here on behalf of the Brazilian Association for Students in Arbitration that is organizing today's webinar together with the Pontifical Catholic University of Sao Paulo and with Canal Mais Direito. I would like to first uh, thank Canal Mais Direito and Franco Maziero, who not only are supporting today's event, but also helping us broadcast it to everyone. I would also like to thank all of our incredible speakers and moderators for kindly agreeing to discuss with us the main issues related to the Vismuth case. And I stress that they'll be discussing the issues and not the case itself. Uh, and I would also like to thank everyone who's watching us. I know that it might not be easy for everyone because of the different time zones, uh, but we hope that today's webinar can contribute to the team's preparation so that you have an amazing this. Uh, and just to explain to everyone a little bit how the webinar will work, we'll have two panels. So the first one will discuss the two main issues on procedure and the second one will discuss the two main issues on the merits. And at the end of everything, we will have 10 to 15 minutes for questions from the audience, depending on how well our speakers obey to the time management that our moderators impose. Uh, so if you guys have any questions and we hope that you do, please leave them here in the live chat. Uh, just remember that they have to be related to general issues. So questions concerning whether Ross Pharmaceuticals should be joined to the arbitration or whether the CIG should be applied to the purchase cooperation and license agreement will have to be answered by you guys and not by your speakers. Uh, but with all of those organization messages out of the way, I would like to introduce our moderators, uh, which I don't think need much of an introduction, but uh, moderating our panel for procedure, we have Professor Stephen Crow. He's a professor for International Dispute Resolution at Bucetius Law School in Hamburg and an independent arbitrator. He's one of the directors of the Vismut and Germany's national correspondent in Central for Arbitration. And then we have uh, Petra Butler moderating the panel for the merit. Uh, she's a professor at Victoria University of Wellington and director for the Institute of Small and Micro States. She's New Zealand's cloud correspondent for the CISG and the United Nations Convention on the Use of Electronic Communications in International Contracts. Both of them have taught and written extensively about numerous areas of law, including international commercial law and dispute resolution, as I'm sure you all know. So uh, if everyone's ready, I will give the virtual floor for Stefan so that he can officially commence the first panel. Thank you, Camilla, and thank you to the organizers for having that. As you're probably already aware, I have a double role here. I'm moderating the first panel, and I'm also a little bit the watchdog uh, to ensure that the speakers are not solving the case for you. Uh, we will discuss general issues, and with such a stellar lineup of speakers, uh, otherwise there would be little left in the case. And that's also for the questions. You can ask all questions you want, and we will only take the ones which are general, uh, fairly general. Um, Perhaps before we start that part, uh, some of you may be interested in some of the figures of this year's mood. We have uh, 387 teams which submitted their memoranda, which means uh, that is a fairly big mood. And whoever is watching the mood presently and hasn't signed up as an arbitrator and isn't eligible to be an arbitrator, we still need a number of arbitrators to have sufficient people doing that. And as the last three years in a row, uh, there's a considerable number of Brazilian teams. Uh, we have 32 Brazilian teams. That is the third time in a row that they are the second largest group, followed then by Germany and India with 29 and the United States with uh, 42 teams. And uh, as every year, we have split up the uh, case in two problems uh, relating to arbitration and two problems relating to the CSG. I will moderate the arbitration problems, which this year are probably fairly pertinent uh, given the uh, situation. And the first speaker on the joiner question will be Professor Daniel Giersberger. He's a founding member of the Faculty of Law of the University of Lucerne and coaching their team since largely the beginning of their participation. In addition, he is a well thought after arbitrator and a partner at uh, or counsel at Wenger Feely, a Swiss law firm. Um, he has taught as adjunct in various international universities and also is the Swiss delegation member for the Hague Conference of the Unification of International Private Law. 
and has been one of the driving forces behind the choice of law convention uh, some of you may have used in the preparations. There are numerous uh, publications on the topic, and what is probably most interesting for you is that he is also a member of the arbitration court of the Swiss Chamber of Arbitration Institution, and thereby also knows a little bit about the rules which are uh, relevant this time, and maybe also knows a little bit about the revision, which may not be relevant for this year's mood, but uh, may give additional arguments. Daniel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Stefan, and I'm really happy to be here speaking to you. Um, the last time I was in Sao Paulo teaching, that was 12 years ago, and um, I have great memories of that period, among others, uh, counting the meetings with Claudio at that time already. So I was asked to speak about Joinder. Complex arbitration can occur in situations where multiple parties entered into one contract or where there are multiple contracts. It also includes situations where two or more parties enter into a number of different contracts with different arbitration agreements. And the issue arises whether the parties' disputes concerning several contracts can be decided in one arbitration. Uh, such issues can, for example, occur in the following situations. Please change the slide. This is a, a first typical situation, a supply chain situation. You have a customer A, a hardware store, who uh, orders um, acrylic glass or plexiglass, as we call it, from supplier B. Supplier B has a sub-supplier C, the manufacturer of the granulate necessary. Now something bad happens, uh, such as COVID-19, please click. Uh, and uh, the supplier C cannot supply the granulate. Uh, what happens then, um, click again, please. Uh, both uh, suppliers cannot provide uh, what they should provide. And uh, customer A, of course, is not happy. He uh, wants to sue supplier B, please click. Um, Supplier B, on the other hand, ask C uh, to deliver or they will be forced to initiate arbitration themselves. Then what happens next? Click. Uh, C says it's a case of force majeure. They have a clause in their contract, but nevertheless, click. Uh, B is sued in arbitration because they have an arbitration clause for their incurred damages. And please click again. Um, it files the arbitration notice to the institution. And while the discussions between BSC and are still ongoing, please click. So uh, supplier B has a first option. He can request for a joinder of sub supplier C, or the second option would be that he could initiate a second arbitration against the sub supplier C and request for consolidation. That's a typical scenario that I've myself uh, also seen in, in actual arbitrations. A construction project is another typical scenario might be interested for interesting for you uh, that there has been a federal Supreme Court case that was just decided by, by our Swiss Federal Supreme Court in that area. Uh, the question may be click here, please click. Uh, whether there have been meetings between including subcontractor C or click even whether there was a tripartite agreement. These are all questions that the Supreme Court had to deal with. Um, again, again, there will be the two options that we saw in the first fact pattern. Uh, that's too fast. Yes. Um, 
And the Supreme Court decided it on another basis, namely whether the arbitration agreement between A and B also uh, applied to uh, the subcontractor C who had not uh, signed an arbitration agreement. Uh, so that's an extension uh, problem. And it applies, of course, uh, also many times in uh, fact patterns where later on a uh, joinder is asked for. I will not dwell on to this extension of arbitration agreement problem because it's a very specific problem as well, uh, but we cannot deal with it here because we just don't have enough time. Please, uh, next slide. This would probably be familiar to most of you in the meantime. Um, I hope I haven't made any mistake. I asked my Moot team uh, to correct it, and they gave me some hints. But the most important, uh, of course, aspects are the three arbitration clauses between um, Clement and Respondent 1 on the one hand, Respondent 1 and Respondent 2 on the other hand, and thirdly, of course, between Respondent 2 and Ross, which certainly play a role, and I don't think that would make me uh, partial already uh, in this uh, presentation play a role in whether a jointer should be allowed or not here. Please go on. Next slide. Yeah, that's the two jointers that we are talking about. Now, uh, this is a provision that you will probably know by now well. A jointer is the action of a third party, not originally named as such, as there are two procedural possibilities which are regularly called intervention if uh, they occur on the initiative of a third party and third party notice if based on a request of claimant or respondent as is the case here in our smooth fact pattern. Only very few national arbitration laws provide for joinder and grant the competence or the joinder or consolidation to arbitral tribunals. I am aware of uh, section 24 of the Australian International Arbitration Act, but that's really a provision that you cannot find in many legis arbitrary, including the ancestral model law of France, Switzerland, Italy, United States, and I'm told Brazil either. Conversely, many institutions, including Article 4.2 of the Swiss rules, provide that the arbitral tribunal can decide on joinder. Um, and uh, many institutional rules have just been revised or are currently being revised to reflect more sophisticated rules on joinder or consolidation, such as the ICC rules or the LCIA rules. And indeed, as Stefan hinted already, Swiss rules are being revised as we speak as well. uh, They uh, will probably enter into force in their revised version below May of 2021, so you will not have to deal with them. Uh, and I can't give you too much of inside information, but as I uh, saw it, uh, it will only uh, affect the procedure to be uh, regarded uh, with regard to joinder and consolidation, uh, including, you know, um, comments uh, to be had by all parties involved. A typical example in the field of joinder is also the revised Article 7 of the ICC rules, please next slide, which contains a new paragraph 5 detailing the circumstances under which a request for joinder may be granted. Uh, these rules will enter into force also next year, the, uh, soon, I think on the 1st of January. So they may uh, be worth to have a look at for you when arguing your case as well, because they are not exactly the same as those uh, you have to deal with in Article 4.2. But nevertheless, it's another indication that there is a certain conversion of institutional rules as we speak in regards to what the requirements for a joinder should be. Next slide. Just for complete, too fast, sorry. Um, 
This is the provision of Article 4.1 Swiss rules that you certainly have read before as well regarding consolidation. I think, as we saw, in fact, patterns that I presented to uh, consolidate will always be taken into account uh, also when at least proceed with regard to third parties. So it's an also a possibility to ask for uh, an arbitration for a consolidation. And interestingly, in Switzerland, as you see here, uh, there are two different bodies that decide these two different things. The arbitral tribunal decides on joinder and the court uh, of uh, the arbitration court of the sky uh, decides on consolidation. So there may be tactical considerations uh, of the parties, how, to would how they would like to approach these issues. Next slide. That would be the revised provision of the ICC rules. You see there are only very few uh, revisions to be made here, but they make a difference. I cannot go into that detail today. Please, next slide. So what are the main legal principles to be considered when deciding about the joinder? The paramount rule is that unlike a state court and arbitral tribunal having authority only over the parties to an arbitral arbitration agreement has no power to compel a person to arbitrate who has not consented to participation. And I'm sure most of you teams will have emphasized this principle in their submissions. There is, of course, autonomy according to which anyone is free to agree on any type of multi-contract or multi-party dispute resolution mechanism, including jointer or consolidation. But there is also the principle of privilege. I'm back. The fact that I agree on arbitration with my contractual partner does not automatically mean that I can be forced to arbitrate with another person, even if it is, if it is a related party or uh, a related contract. It is widely accepted that given the consensual nature of arbitration, joinder as a principle requires consent of the disputing parties and any third party. However, and that's where many com commentators are mixing up two things, there is A, the consent to arbitrate, and B, the consent to join or be joined to an ongoing arbitration. As a, These are two different matters. In a join situation, the most important issue in this context is whether consent can be implied. If one party to existing arbitration proceedings requests a third party to be joined or a third party wishes to be joined. Such a joinder is, of course, not a problem if the arbitration agreement contains language to that effect, which is, however, only very rarely the case nowadays. Modern institutional rules are in interpreting to reflect the presumption of union in that respect with regard to for two of the Swiss rules. However, these commentators have been criticized for union or the institution in consolidation, too far reaching competences to order a joinder without the consent of all other parties. Uh, parties. For example, given the consensual nature of arbitration, it has often been argued that Article 4.2 Swiss rules cannot be a substitute for the consent of the parties. However, a tendency appears to develop according to which the deciding body, so in joint situations, the arbitral tribunal, must rely on the specific circumstances of each case when making the decision on joinder. The tendency of institutions that revise their rules is now clearly to further anticipate and define such circumstances. What uh, further principles do those bodies have to take? Certainly, equality and be first, foremost, 
the joinder of a third person after the tribunal has been constituted raises concerns regarding equal treatment. Is it safeguarded if the joining party must accept the activities undertaken in the ongoing proceedings and not least the existing composition of the arbitral tribunal? One easy way to deal with this problem is to ensure the time before the appointment of the arbitral tribunal has occurred, and there are provisions in certain institutional rules, such as Article 7.1 of the ICC rules, the existing rules. Another more and more follow method is to presume a waiver of anyone in to a rule. The Swiss rules. As a more general matter, any joinder must safeguard the right to be heard, which is, once the arbitration proceedings have progressed, also a matter of the right of any joined party to read and to comment on the existing file and activities, and indeed on the request of joinder. As a result, some institutional rules, such as, for example, the Stockholm rules, have limited joinder to the stage of the answer to uh, the uh, notice of arbitration. As the V's mood fact pattern shows uh, in conflicts of interests, namely confidentiality may be a major issue in joinder situations, which should not easily be curtailed. Uh, uh, similar considerations apply, for example, uh, regarding third party financing with regard to conflicts of interest. And uh, procedural efficiency is uh, a very important principle in this respect. And indeed, is now expressly stated in various institutional rules, including the Swiss rules. It is important frequently in uh, consolidation, but also in joinder situations. There is certainly an argument to be made in that respect in the V-Smooth, and I'm sure most of you have done that already in their first writing. Again, the most important factor to be considered here is how far the proceedings have already progressed when joinder is sought. And finally, again, the V-Smooth fact pattern demonstrates that the risk of avoiding decisions cannot be taken lightly will certainly not accept the decision taken against it when it has objected to the joinder earlier. Of course, this will uh, raise the issue whether it must appeal, if possible, the decision of the arbitral tribunal to accept the joinder. If it is the body having the competence to order a joinder, and there is a nice detail in Swiss law on this, because um, in consolidation situations, uh, you would have a problem to appeal the decision of the court, the court of sky because it's not considered as appealable under swiss law now uh, just showing you the slides without commenting them much uh, on the competence to this and the scope of discretion of the bodies uh, please show the next slide You see, in most uh, rules, it's similar, but not identical. Uh, for example, the ICC court uh, has a prima phase G assessment uh, uh, competence, but uh, regularly the joinder issues are determined by the arbitral tribunal and Uh, the arbitral tribunal has uh, as reflected in most of the rules by using uh, language such as taking account all relevant circumstances or the like. Uh, similar uh, competencies, but not equal competencies, uh, are uh, there with regard to consolidation. Please, next slide. There are differences between areas who won't go into them now. Please show the next slide. Now, uh, what circumstances will have to be considered by the deciding body? So that's mostly the arbitral tribunal in a joint situation. 
uh, may play a role. It has a uh, joinder, and uh, as I've uh, said already, most jurisdictions don't. But they have provisions that may show that, that they are because they don't, for example, privity of contracts as much as other jurisdictions. Institutional arbitration rules, of course, will matter. As we have seen, not all institutions have similar wording regarding joinder and not similar competence and not similar discretion. The choice of law on the merits may also make a difference. For England, we have if this law is chosen, provisions on binding, binding effects of warranties of third parties that may even be called into a, a dispute in a court. So that may also influence of the arbitral tribunal with regard to joinder. Claims arising from the same transaction, of course, will be a determining factor in many uh, situations. Some uh, institutional rules even uh, expressly make a reference to this consideration such as again the calm rules daniel i have are there identical arbitration understanding you really and i think we are running also a little bit out of out of time i don't know whether anyone else has the problems uh, the connection problems yeah because you're largely uh, i can hardly hear you finished Oh, that's really a pity, but uh, I'm almost finished anyway, so nothing to repair there. Uh, I have uh, one minute to go. Identical arbitration, of course, are a very important aspect. Uh, the most important aspects, of course, once you enter into the hearing phase, for example, there is no use of joining parties and probably not even in the uh, second uh, round of submissions most of the time. And there may be a lot of further considerations. The David versus Goliath problem, do, does a party that has only a small aspect of the dispute really have to invo be involved in the big picture and also pay uh, for it? That uh, consideration that has to be uh, considered. And uh, that leads me to my conclusion. The answer to the question, uh, is there a need for consent, is a clear yes, there is a near need for consent. But to what extent the consent may be presumed in a particular situation depends on various factors. Supposedly, there are two circumstances of each case. Thank you very much, and sorry for the bad quality of my presentation. Thank you, Daniel. The presentation was not bad quality. It was more the proper introduction to the next topic, yeah, our problems with virtual hearings. Um, most of us has, have sat in front of these type of hearings and have been frustrated uh, with these type of connection problems. And those who participated last year will remember that also there was a major issue. Uh, on the issue of virtual hearings or remote hearings, we have Professor Manuel Gomez, who is a professor of law and associate dean at the Florida International University College of Law. He's the editor-in-chief of the World Arbitration Mediation Review, a board member of the Miami International Arbitration Society, and leader of the Latin American and Caribbean group of the Silicon Valley Arbitration and Mediation Center. Manuel is also an ardent supporter of this mood. Uh, you see him in Hong Kong and Vienna. And uh, Manuel, the floor is yours. And I hope the connection is better. Thank you. We'll see. Thank you, Stefan. And uh, and you see me virtually too, so you can't get a whole. You you can't get rid of me. Um. So obviously, I I want also to thank the the, the organizers. Uh, my dear friend Claudio Camila, who's who's up, who's always up for 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 all these challenges, and it's great to see uh, old friends, uh, Petra obviously, and, and Stefan, and new friends uh, Daniel and Federico. Uh, Stefan, you and your colleagues for keeping the mood alive, and obviously all the participants in in the mood. 
And uh, on that note, this year has brought, it's really the tester and, and, and the mood has been a phenomenal uh, test for, for what it means to use technology. Uh, in, the, in the preceding years to, to COVID-19, there were a, a lot of talks about technology and, uh, and obviously the proponents of technology, they all thought, you know, this is overdue. We are ready for a virtual life. The technology is there. All the vendors, you know, we knew of Zoom, uh, obviously, and and uh, and some of the competitors. Uh, and we thought, you know, it's of course it's going to be it's ready. You no, know, we fantasized about that. But when reality hit us, uh, we realized that that it's a it's a whole different story when you when you have that reality. Uh, on the note that on the on the topic that 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 is is the the subject of my presentation. The World Bank and other multinational, uh, multilateral organizations have been investing in access to justice initiatives for a long time. Uh, uh, the European Union has advanced all these uh, phenomenal uh, projects on access to justice broadly. Uh, obviously, arbitration or commercial arbitration is not first in line uh, to, to, as a candidate for a discussion on access to justice. But as arbitration become a more subject of normative regulation, as arbitration intersects more with, uh, with the administration of justice, and, and naturally we have those points of contact between the arbitral process and courts, when courts are called to assist the arbitral proceedings, we have there, a, a, it, it comes up the idea of, of access to justice, the right to be heard, and so on and so forth. Obviously, at the end of the arbitral proceedings, when the discussion of whether to, to set aside or later on to refuse the recognition and enforcement of an award and could be achieved on the basis of a violation of fundamental rights. And almost every uh, constitution or legal system in the world, regardless of level of development of that nation, has something on access to justice, on the right to be heard, on due process. So. For, for this specific topic in the context of international commercial arbitration, and let me just add that in, in international commercial arbitration is really the catalyzer, or it's really the, 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 the medium that allows, a, number one, to test whether those concepts are practicable, and two, how, do, how, to, uh, how to make those concepts a reality how the, the, the concept of delivering justice in an efficient way and in a fair manner it can, be, can be a reality. So um, I, want, I have, I have a, a few very specific points surrounding the idea that the when and how should virtual hearings be ordered by an arbitral tribunal, which is the, the specific question that I was asked to cover. And, uh, and let me just preface that with, um, reference to, to three uh, normative sources from the model law. I will only refer to the model law and then perhaps give uh, a couple of examples from, from legislation. And the, the relevant provisions of the model law that we look at uh, when we try to answer those two questions, the when and how, are naturally Article 18 of the model law that says the parties shall be treated with equality and each party shall be given a full opportunity of present in his case. Uh, different uh, uh, countries that adopt the model law, some adopt the Article 18 verbatim, some have not adopted Article 18. Venezuela, for example, is a country that has, has said, if you, if you read the law, it says, this is a model law jurisdiction, but there's no Article 18. And why? Because that country doesn't believe in Article 18? No, because that country in the constitution has a provision that says, the parties should be treated with equality, and each party should be given a full opportunity of presenting their case. And there is also a constitutional provision there that says every mechanism for dispute resolution is deemed to be part of the administration of justice uh, complex. So, so that would be one indirect way to get to arbitration in a, in a jurisdiction that doesn't specifically have an Article 18-like provision in the commercial arbitration statute. Then the next provision is Article 19, 19 uh, of the model law, 
191 uh, that speaks to, you know, basically subject to the provisions of this law, the parties are free to agree on the procedure to be followed by the arbitral tribunal. 19.2 gives the arbitral tribunal the authority or power to conduct the arbitration in, in, in any manner, in such manner as it considers it appropriate. There is a, then lastly another provision, Article 24, that uh, covers specifically uh, hearing and, and written proceedings. So moving on, uh, I just wanted to, to go over four minor points and I'll do it uh, within, within a minute each, uh, Stefan, so, so we can move on. So the first question, and those are basically, what are the four questions that arise when you're analyzing a case uh, and you're trying to figure out when and, and how should an arbitral hearing or be ordered by an arbitral tribunal? So the first question is, has to do with whether there is a right to a hearing. Uh, and that, that necessitates that you take a look at the party autonomy. You know, party autonomy is a big elephant in the room here. Uh, we know that party autonomy is the pillar of arbitration. Arbitration would not exist if there were no party autonomy. First of all, to enter into an arbitration agreement. So, but the question here is a finer question is, is there a right to a hearing? It's not that if the parties have have autonomy. Obviously, the parties have autonomy. But the question is, do the parties do, do the parties have a right to a hearing? And you can do the finer question: Do the parties have a right to an oral hearing? And you could do the finer question: Do the parties have a right to an oral hearing in person? So all those layers, you get the picture because you had to read a problem uh, that dealt with it. Uh, Somebody's not hearing me? We're hearing you quite okay. well. I saw yeah. I saw a comment that somebody wasn't hearing me. So anyway, so the right, you know, the the basically just to move on to the next the next one, uh, the party, the the right to a hearing is you can get finer and finer as if you're peeling an onion. So your study, your analysis has to peel the onion. The right is very big, so right to a hearing, right to an oral hearing, right to an oral hearing in person. So uh, is it expressly provided for arbitration in the law of the jurisdiction? Is it expressly provided for litigation and implicitly provided for arbitration? That would be a second possibility. Is it not provided at all? So the, 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 the country doesn't say anything, the arbitration statute doesn't say anything, litigation, uh, the civil, the code of civil procedure doesn't say anything. In in a, in a jurisdiction, it might be even prohibited. Uh, I haven't found that example, but it might be the case. Uh, or that the party said no, no to any hearing. We don't want to see each other, never ever. We just want to do it through document. Then the second issue is whether the tribunal has an authority. We know that nineteen. Uh, gives a 192 gives a tribunal authority a 24 model law uh, these numbers are all articles of the model law and um, so so then the question is how far can the tribunal go are there and 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 there we have two limits limit number one the mandatory provisions regarding let's take that onion again the right to a hearing, the right to an oral hearing, the right to an a right to an oral physical hearing. So, depending on how it is in your jurisdiction, how 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 high the bar is for um, for for determining that this is fun fundamental to the rights of the party in an arbitration proceeding, you would you would uh, be able to assert this is a mandatory provision that the arbitral tribunal should follow or the parties should follow. So what are the, about the parties, the, 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 the second boundary that the tribunal has is the agreement of the parties on the country, going back to, to autonomy, right? So Article 24, one of the model law um, starts off by saying, subject to any contrary agreement by the parties, you get the picture. So 24, one, would say the tribunal may, but subject to a contrary agreement by the parties. 
19.2, which is the, the, the superpowers to the tribunal to lead the proceedings, starts with failing such agreement. So the model law recognizes the authority of the tribunal, but even more importantly, recognizes that this authority stems from the parties. So the question that arises there is what if the parties are irrational and the parties impose on the tribunal something that is counter to the tribunal's uh, sense of whether there is a fair proceeding, whether there is a right to it, the, an obligation to the parties to, to give the parties an, a, an equal opportunity to present their case and so on and so forth. Um, then the, the, the next item, actually I'm gonna conflate three and four, uh, and I'm gonna end with this, has to do with how important is that right, which leads to a breach if the right is not upheld, and what's the effect of that breach? Is that breach sufficient to allow the losing party to set aside the award based on public policy, due process? What could it be? You would have to look at the actual uh, law that it's relevant for the parties to, to, to analyze the, the, you know, the setting aside of the award. Uh, then another question that is very, very important that has to do with waiver to that uh, challenge is when shall the party raise the breach? Shall the party raise the breach as soon as the party realizes that there is a breach to the right to an oral hearing in person? Uh, and if they don't, do they waive it? There are jurisdictions that consider that that's a waiver. They said, did you find out that the arbitrators were being arbitrary arbitrary, uh, or being going against your own rules, but you convalidated it because you didn't say anything. You connected on Zoom. We have proof that you were connected there. Well, but we couldn't hear, but you never raised it. And then finally, and this is finally, finally, then at the recognition and enforcement stage, uh, there are, you know, the New York Convention, Article 5, uh, you could go three routes, Article 5.1b was the right of the party to present their case, the, what, uh, what we could use to request the enforcing court refuse the recognition enforcement of this award because the violation of that led to, uh, uh, and it affected the party, the right of the party to present the case. Article 5.1d, irregularity of the proceedings. Article 5.2b, public policy of the country where enforcement is sought. And just to end, uh, Article 5.2b, the public policy, sometimes is raised together with 5.1b. Sometimes a party that is challenged, that is, that is seeking to the, for the enforcing court to refuse a recognition enforcement on the basis of a, a breach to the party's right to present their case, that sometimes or oftentimes that also uh, infringes upon uh, the public policy of the country, even more so considering, as I said earlier, that most countries around the world have a high, high regard for due process and uh, the right to present one, one's case is usually the, deemed of public policy. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Mona, for, for staying, staying in, in, in time. In particular, particular we, we have, have very limited time, time for the uh, questions now. Uh, there have been a number of questions. Um, I'm pretty sure that we will hear a lot of elephants in the room and peeling onions uh, in the future in the oral hearings. Uh, but the first question goes to Daniel. Someone wants to know what are the considerations, relevant circumstances in the context of Article 4.2, uh, and again, you have stayed very general. That would be very helpful if you stay general again and not give some of the circumstances from the case directly. Um, uh, for those who have seen the slides, uh, the last slide, which was the green, uh, the green uh, titles there, I, I've tried to address them it, uh, in a more general manner. Of course, not not uh, just with regard to the um, Wiesmuth case. 
Uh, I think the stage of the proceedings will be one of the most important element. Um, consent, uh, less, of course, consent in a way that you would need a identical oration agreement and uh, or at least identical with regard to the most important aspects of the arbitration agreement seat, um, for example, and uh, also the um, transaction. It should be a, the same transaction, basically. If it's two different transactions, you won't normally be joined. That's That would maybe a, a, a case for, for consolidation, but not for a joinder if it's two different transactions, unless they are so closely related that you would look at it as one uh, commercial uh, transaction. Okay, thank but you. There are many then, more elements. Um, Manuel, um, you have probably also practically experienced with uh, hearings online or virtual hearings. And one of the question is, uh, does an offline in person hearing change uh, how you perceive witnesses? Is there a loss or gain in efficiency? And would that be an argument against or in favor of a virtual hearing? Yes, obviously it, it changes the same way how we, it changes how we are interacting here. You know, we have, I could have a phone, an iPad, actually I have a phone and iPad, but they're, 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 they they're face down. Why? Because, you know, we, we have the temptation of doing different things. Obviously it, uh, it changes and, and all of you who, who teach and you have had the experience of teaching to your students remote, you know, you know, I'll, you know some that those who are not paying attention, but you don't know most of it. You don't know if people are looking at you, the camera is on top. Anyway, of course there is a, of course there is an effect. But what's important here, Stefan, is not whether uh, there is an effect for one for one witness that helps them. Uh, some witnesses are are better off when they are comfortable sitting in their office. Uh, that has happened to me in hearings during the pandemic. Uh, you know, sometimes I'm in my element, uh, as opposed to being in a in a in a in a in a place that I'm that is not comfortable to me. Sometimes I'm worse off. Uh, but what's important here, for purposes of of this, in any case, is that both parties are in equal footing. That if if all witnesses, if if a witness is being is being taken, the, the testimony is being taken remotely that you do it for everybody else and not that you do some in person, some remotely. I've also been in those contexts pre-COVID and you could tell the difference. Sometimes it was extraordinarily helpful to the party to have the witness in their own office far away. Sometimes it hurt them. And now I cannot hear you. Again, as I said, we are showing what are the dis differences or what are the problems with virtual hearings. Uh, so thank you very much to Daniel and Manuel for giving a good overview of the issues which may arise in joinder and virtual hearings. And to avoid to take too much time from the second panel, I would now hand over to Petra to deal with the CSG issues. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Steph uh, Stefan. Um, I would like to join everybody else and thank the organizers. I say uh, hello to all the Vismutis and especially the Brazilian ones. I was in Brazil five years ago and taught uh, in Sao Paulo. And we, my youngest son and I had a fantastic time in Brazil. So I think we do it the same way. We will let Claudio and Frederico speak first and then take questions at the end. So I would like to um, introduce uh, Claudio. And so Claudio Finkelstein is an arbitrator and full professor of private international law and arbitration law at the Pontifical Catholic University of Sao Paulo. He is the vice president of the Brazilian Society of International Law and editor of the Constitutional and International Law Review. He is also a board member of the Arbitration Law Review and what he forgot to um, tell me and didn't want to say he is a fantastic, this mood, um, you know, uh, uh, 
person and a great friend of the Vesmut. So Claudio, your, um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Petra. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, thank you, Stefan, for participating with us. Uh, the same to Daniel, Manuel, Federico. It's, it's such an honor to have you all sharing those, those concepts with us. Uh, I'll, I'll be talking about the applicability of the CISG for license agreements and transfer of know-how. And uh, I'll try as much as possible to walk away from the facts of the case as possible. But uh, if, if I step over any line, please uh, uh, stop me. It might be automatic, but uh, uh, I'll do my best. Uh, if, if the question was, uh, is the CISG applicable to license agreement and transfer of know-how agreement like the pure hearted, the, the traditional license agreement, I would probably say no, uh, but the wonderful thing about the CISG is, is that it is a living organism. It's it's uh, it's something that develops as time goes by. I mean, it goes way beyond the original language of the drafters. And uh, uh, if if the question was posed today, and, and it actually it, it is posed today, I'd say yes, it is applicable. I'm I'm always in favor of the applicability of the CISG because it's part of international law, it's part of uh, the movement of unification of international law, it's something that the international trade as a whole uh, would benefit. Uh, not long ago, if, if you bought a, a software for your computer, like a Microsoft uh, a software, you would be receiving a, a book like a full blown book with instructions and and uh, uh, a floppy disk. I mean, most of the kids have absolutely no idea what's a floppy disk, and but it has evolved uh, all the way to a CD ROM, and you also had a key, so you actually had property of this. You could delete, you could reinstall anywhere else. You would have property of uh, something that is being licensed, and you have a perpetual license. I mean, it would be a good. And, and it will be delivered to you. As, as time uh, uh, went by and, and, and things have changed, uh, and I might be wrong because I'm not that high tech, uh, I understand nowadays we simply don't buy a license anymore. We buy a, a user's license and uh, it has to be renewed every single year. Uh, and I mean, things are, are changing dramatically. Uh, not long ago, I used to travel uh, oh, traveling, I mean, I really miss it. But uh, my kids, I mean, they, they used to love uh, 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 games for PlayStation. And and it was also a CD-ROM. I mean, it was a property. You bought it, you use it, you can go to your friend's house. Uh, things have changed. And, and with, with changes, uh, now you don't have the physical storage uh, uh, thing. Uh, you have uh, uh, a account. In, in uh, somewhere in the clouds and, and and things are completely different. I mean, you don't have uh, actual uh, delivery of uh, uh, the thing you're, you're using. I'm not even sure you're using it, but uh, uh, things are differently and moving differently as we speak with the evolution of time. And, and when we're talking about high tech uh, license agreements, uh, things do change and they do change a lot. Uh, the first consideration we'd have to have to answer this question is uh, the, the the place of business and domicile of the parties. So if the parties are both domiciled in a, a CISG contracting state, there is very little doubt that uh, uh, for those sophisticated agreements, uh, the CISG would apply. Uh, if one of the parties is, 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 is a signatory and the other is not, we we'll probably we we'll probably know we most certainly have to resort to the rules of of, of uh, private international law. So once you check the rules of uh, conflict of laws of uh, uh, those jurisdictions, if there are there there are no provision contrary to the use of foreign law, some jurisdictions they do have uh, provisions not allowing uh, the application of foreign law. Uh, uh, you would have to use uh, the CISG. 
Uh, it's always important to say that uh, DCIS is not an opt-in, it's an opt-out. So uh, once you've appointed or elected Brazilian law or, or Chinese law or any law of a signatory country, uh, you've automatically elected to be subject to the CISG. Uh, when we're talking about uh, 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 know-how or license agreements, uh, we have to go uh, uh, to Article 3 of the CISG. It's, it's, it's mandatory. So if we're talking about a contract for a supply of a certain good to be manufactured, uh, such as, and, and once again, I mean, we're talking about uh, uh, evolution. And, and one of the things I would love to hear, Petra, is uh, uh, we, we're heading towards the moment that you will be able to buy a human heart. You'll be able to buy a human ear, something that's uh, either tailor-made or uh, generically made to be replaced. Uh, I mean, is, is it a good? I mean, it's... it's or not, but th this is not the topic over here. I mean, this is just uh, to put a buzz on, on everybody's ear. But the uh, question is, uh, what is a good? I mean, what is a good under under uh, uh, the CISG? It has to have some physical uh, uh, medium. It has to have uh, uh, the possibility of getting hold of it. And when we're talking about high-tech issues, uh, it really doesn't matter if it's uh, uh, microscopic. I mean, if, if, if you have something uh, which is not a cold, I mean, it, I mean, if we're talking about a genetic cold or something like it, it's, it's, it's a completely different story. But if you can place it in a microscope and you can get hold of it, uh, uh, you have something that you received, it's been delivered, uh, ideally being paid for, if not, the case would would be dramatically different. Uh, so it, 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 it's very clear to me that uh, under those circumstances, the CISG will be applicable. Uh, of course, uh, we might have uh, uh, cases in which Article 3 uh, uh, will take a very important role in which the buyer is also the supplier of parts uh, to be used in the transformation of the good, and, and then we'd have uh, a huge discussion on the preponderance or the substantial part uh, of, of the agreement itself, in, in, in which case uh, things would be a lot murkier. Uh, we, also, we also know we, we mostly have to take into consideration uh, Article 7 of the CISG, uh, uh, which calls for a, a regard uh, in the international character uh, and the need to promote uniformity in international trade. So it's basically a overall concept that it's it's hard to gather. Uh, remember, we have uh, on Article 7 uh, uh, the need uh, to absorb good faith in international trade. But if we're talking of mercury or landscape or quicksand, uh, I would try to avoid uh, uh, any discussions on, on good faith. I myself believe there is a need to observe uh, good faith, but I'm most definitely sure that my concept of good faith is probably different uh, from Petra and from Stefan and from everyone in here. So uh, try to avoid it. Uh, also Article 8, the intent of the parties, as has been said by Manuel and Daniel, is of paramount importance. So the intent of the parties is, is uh, uh, of crucial importance. Uh, of course, if in the drafting of the contract, the parties made it very clear that they want the application of the CISG, uh, or better yet, they, they, they have included in the contract what is the preponderant part of, of, of the contract, uh, be it in quantitative or qualitative uh, 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 criteria, it would make our life a lot easier, but then it would not make a good mood case. Um, so, bottom line is uh, uh, the recent changes in, in the length, landscape of international contracts uh, with with software, as I just started saying, and tailor-made goods uh, uh, 
have made this dis discussion on, on quantitative and qualita qualitative criteria uh, very important. Uh, I myself am, am favorable uh, to the financial criteria. I, I, I know uh, there is a long-going discussion and uh, there is a, a discrepancy in the various languages of TCISG, uh, whereas in, in, in English, uh, uh, we have substantial as, as, as the operative word, uh, the French version, and as, as far as I understand, the German uh, version also says essential. So we, we, we have, once again, depending on what kind of dealing we're talking about, to understand the deal itself. Uh, try to imagine a, a paper recycling uh, facility. So you have a huge machine for uh, uh, like a kiln for melting down paper and rubbish uh, uh, into a paper pulp. Uh, once it's finished, you have to replace uh, uh, those uh, uh, material, uh, replace, no, remove those material and move to another machine in which you will uh, take out the rubbish and uh, the useless uh, uh, parts of, of, of the, the pulp and make recycled paper. So you have two different machines, but uh, then comes uh, technological evolution and you have only one machine. So we're talking about two completely different things because uh, the new machine is only a machine with, with a software incorporated. So there is absolutely no way you can just have uh, some, some uh, software tailor-made to make the first machine work with the second machine. Uh, on the other hand, uh, talking about uh, health-related uh, uh, issues, uh, I myself have been doing a lot of uh, MRs, the magnetic resonance exams, and and it's 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 really a pain because you you probably have all done that. You enter into a tunnel machine, and you have to do 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 do, and you spend like an hour, sometimes two hours, in the machine to have an exam. Uh, as far as I understand, some, some uh, 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 research facilities, they have developed uh, technology using the same machine to reduce waiting time to 5 to 12 minutes. I would pay anything to have that. Uh, but then you have an improvement in the same machine. You could either buy the machine with those uh, uh, characteristics on, or you could update it. So those are completely different contracts. And those are the things that we have to take into consideration when deciding uh, if absence intent of the parties in defining what's the applicable law, uh, what is actually the applicable law. Is it the CISG or any other domestic law? Uh, finally, uh, uh, if I were asked if, if, if is there a border between uh, sales and service uh, uh, in, CI and in the CISG, uh, I, I would have to go and understand what's the predominant nature of this international contract. Uh, if the question was, uh, can the same contract uh, for transfer of technology and know-how and transfer of goods uh, have two applicable laws, the same contract with the same terms and conditions, uh, I would have to say yes, it's not desirable. Uh, but the answer would probably have to be uh, yes. So you could have uh, one contract uh, mm -hmm. with two distinct uh, uh, obligations within it. So we have to take uh, upon the challenge of uh, deciding what's uh, the preponderant uh, element of this contract. Thank you very much, Petra. Thank you so much, uh, Clo uh, Clo Claudio, and I think there will be uh, lots of questions. But we now hand over to Federico, who is um, a barrister, an arbitrator, and the Vismut coach for the uh, Honorable Society of Grace in Federico, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Petra. Uh, and again, uh, 
thank you to the organizers and uh, my fellow colleagues and speakers uh, for making this such a great event. Um, so I've got some slides. Uh, I'd like to preface this by saying that I'm probably the odd one out here. First of all, uh, I'm the only, I think, non-professor uh, and non-academic. I'm the practitioner. Uh, and uh, I'm also the only one that's qualified in a non-signatory CISG country uh, who's been invited to speak about the CISG uh, and its interpretation. So. Um, I'll probably take a slightly different approach to uh, my colleagues. I'm not really going to give you any answers. Um, first of all, because Stefan said, whatever you do, don't give them any answers. And uh, second of all, because I'm not being paid. So all I'm going to do is uh, raise some questions, which I hope will, will maybe uh, elucidate uh, some of the issues uh, for you Mootees. So uh, as an English lawyer, I suppose what I'll do is, is, is do the thing that everyone hates us for, which is I'm going to talk a little bit about English law. And I'm going to say, well, uh, this position, uh, when I had a look at it, uh, I, I, there isn't that much case law to clarify with any certainty uh, one position or another. And of course, the fact that the organizers of the Vismut decided to add it as an issue uh, should have already indicated to you that that's the case. Um, and that's the same position in English law. We have section 12 of, of the Sale of Goods Act, and it's uh, generally a two-prong uh, right. First of all, it's a con it attaches a condition that the seller uh, ha has the right to sell the goods. And secondly, it's a warranty for the quiet enjoyment of the goods by the buyer. Uh, and we only really have two major cases about it, one dating back from 1921 and a second from 1975, both by Lord Denning, which uh, uh, recognized the fact that intellectual property rights affecting uh, the non-conformity uh, would also fall within that, that position. So if we move on to the next slide. Uh, so here is Article 42.1, and as you can see, I've underlined some bits, and it's really those bits that you're all going to be tackling to try and decide uh, whether or not it applies to the problem that you're dealing with. But whether or not it's the problem of the viz or any other problem, these are the points that really you need to decide one way or another. Um, and uh, you'll see that it's quite chunky. There's quite a lot underlined there. I'm not a big fan of underlying, but in this particular case, I'll make an exception. Um, so there's quite a, a few elements that we need to look at uh, to be able to determine uh, what, what the specific facts of the case that we're dealing with, which side they will fall, whether or not um, uh, uh, Article 42 uh, applies, and if so, how. So if we can move on to the next slide. Let's take the first element, which is right or claim. Well, you need to decide um, what is a right or claim. Uh, does it need to be invoked? If you just have a mere right, but you never invoke it, does that trigger Article 42 uh, or not? Um, well, most legal rights are normally uh, uh, come into effect on the invocation of such a right. So otherwise the warranty uh, it, it is kind of pointless. Um, also look at um, Article 41, and Article 41, 42, and 43, they interplay together. So make sure you have a look at all three of them and then just go to 42. Um, valid rights or uh, very valid claims or any claim? What is a valid claim exactly? Um, you need to think about that and, and, and think whether or not even an invalid claim would trigger it or not. And how would you know whether a claim is valid or isn't at any point? Uh, bearing in mind that the language of Article 42 uh, is prescriptive about time. It's at the time the contract was concluded. So whatever happens afterwards may well be irrelevant, and you need to be thinking about that. And you also need to be thinking about the general premise upon which Article 42 came about. So it's to protect the buyer. That's the underlying uh, philosophy behind it. Is the buyer entitled to know of defects in title? 
Um, unlike uh, Article 35, which all falls under Part 2 of the CISG as nonconformity, um, as Claudio has talked about now, what is a good? Um, one deals with sort of tangible qualities of nonconformity, and Articles 41, 42, and 43 uh, deal with title. Um, so if we go back to Section 12, it's whether or not the seller has a right to sell whatever it is that they've sold to you. That's what Articles 41, 42, and 43 deal with. Um, everything else is dealt with under the earlier articles. So if you had knowledge of any defect on title, would that have affected the price? Um, well, you need to be thinking about that. The other thing you need to think about is our common law concept of caveat emptor. And this is perhaps a tension between civil and common law jurisdictions. Of course, uh, anyone will know that in a common law jurisdiction like England and Wales, we tend to say, unless it's prohibited, you can do whatever you want. Uh, whilst in a prescriptive, more prescriptive civil law jurisdiction, you have more positive rights. So they'll try and make sure that the parties have equal footing and all those lovely, uh, uh, huggy, nicey things that we don't really have. You know, the good faith concept for an English lawyer is like a unicorn, isn't it? It's, it's this, 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 this uh, thing that everyone is looking for that uh, I'm not sure uh, I'm convinced happens in reality, where the parties on opposite sides of the contract are truly going to act in good faith. But, you know, civil lawyers, our civil friends, uh, certainly uh, hold that in high regard. And so you need to consider that. And then finally, it's about quiet possession. It's like that second element of the SGA, the Sale of Goods Act, uh, uh, Section 12. Um, ultimately, if you're buying something, the purpose of this is to allow the buyer to enjoy quiet possession of what it is that they've bought. So if we can move on to the next slide. The next, so the next issue is, is the question that you have to think about. What about vexatious claim? Is there anyone who makes an allegation? Does that therefore give the buyer a right to some kind of remedy from the seller? Uh, you need to think about that and, and again go back to that point about, well, how do you know whether a claim is vexatious or not? Um, the language of Article 42 is somewhat vague on all that uh, and you need to decide, depending on whose side you're in, whether you wish to argue a more cautious approach or whether you need to argue a more bold approach. Okay, next slide, please. So the next point of the language of Article 42 is uh, industrial or other intellectual property. Uh, that's not defined within the CISG itself, but you don't need to look very far to be able to find a definition that I suspect none of the arbitrators, not even Stefan, will be able to shut you down on, which is that uh, the WIPO definition, the World Intellectual Property Organization, which says that it includes all rights resulting from intellectual activity in the industrial, scientific, literary, or artistic fields. So no need to say any more about that. Uh, the next slide, please. So then what we see that Article 42 really is, is a limitation. So if you read Article 41, you'll see that it's got a quite wide scope warranty for uh, the buyer against the seller. What Article 42 does, and it's cited within Article 41, Article 41, it says, uh, yes, you can have recourse, you can have a warranty for any nonconformity issues. Uh, hang on, accept, accept industrial and intellectual property to uh, rights, which will be governed under uh, Article 42. And then what you see are limitations within Article 42. The first one is about knowledge. So, of course, the language of uh, Article 42 itself is that uh, at the time of the conclusion, uh, the seller knew, and the seller knew is pretty straightforward. We know what uh, knowing or not knowing is. It's actual knowledge. So if you can prove the seller had actual knowledge, uh, that's not a, a problem at all. The next language is something which I I. Uh, do not like at all, but um, having looked into it, I suppose it does what it says in the tin, which is could not have been unaware. Apart from the fact that uh, as a matter of English grammar, a double negative is, is a terrible, terrible faux pas. Um, uh, what does that mean? Could not have been unaware. Does it mean should have known? 
Uh, we know that actual knowledge is new, so it can't be that. It's got to be something beyond that. Does it raise a duty to make reasonable inquiries? Well, let's look at the language of Article 43, which says something slightly different. This Article 43 is to do with notices, and it uses, uh, under the first subparagraph, a uh, reasonable time after he has become aware or ought to have become aware. Well, ought to have become aware, to me, is different to could not have been unaware. It, it, it imposes something more, and what that more is, is something that you have to figure out. But... Um, as, as an English lawyer, I suppose it means something more akin to constructive knowledge. You really should have known. Uh, it means something more like, you, well, you could have inquired and you could have found out and you, you had a duty to make those reasonable inquiries. Um, and then knowledge of what? If you look again at the language of Article 42, there are two things. One is the use uh, for resale, right? Uh, and the second is in respect of otherwise used. Well, what does otherwise used mean? And how much knowledge would you have known about that otherwise use? Uh, you need to think about those things. It's obviously, uh, when we couple that together with a consideration of at the time of the conclusion of the contract, you would only know whatever you knew at that time and nothing else. And, uh, of course, then um, put that within the context of the timing. Um, but to me, could not have been unaware. Well, they say a picture says a thousand words. So if we can have the next slide, um, then this is my conclusion of uh, could not have been unaware. Um, probably the ostrich test, you know, have you buried your head in the sand or not? Uh, so moving on to the next slide, please. So the second limitation that appears to be imposed by uh, Article 42, uh, and that falls within uh, Article uh, 42, 1, uh, under the uh, letters A and B. So first of all, it's, and it's to do with location, um, the first one is a state contemplated by the parties. Well, the first question to me as a lawyer is, what does contemplated mean? Does it mean it's in the contract or something outside of the contract? Um, it was just something considered by the parties, uh, and, 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 and to what extent has that been communicated between the parties? So that's the first question you need to think about. Then what if there was more than one state? Because the language of Article 42 is in the singular, just a state. Uh, so if there was more than one state, does it mean that you can only have the state, the first state you raised, or the main state? Or does it fall back into... 41 to B, uh, the default position. Well, consider that, and no doubt you can bring arguments either side of that. Uh, and then consider what could the seller have known or could have not known, not been unaware of uh, that the buyer would not. Uh, and again, uh, we'll, if, when you look at 42 2, uh, this will all crystallize as to what, 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 what are we trying to get to here? Uh, and then finally, um, you know, there is generally going to be a presumption probably that the buyer will normally know uh, or be presumed to know about any external factors uh, in a place where the seller is going to resell or use, which is neither the seller's or the buyer's jurisdiction. Uh, and then look at the default position, which is under 42.1a, uh, and that is basically that if 42 uh, one, sorry, 42.1b is the default position. If 42.1a doesn't apply, then 42.1b will apply, and that just basically means the buyer's place of business. But that's all, again, caveated under 42.2. So if we can have the next slide. The second limitation is really summed up in, in this slide, I think. Did the buyer say where? Uh, and if they did, then need to consider that state. And if they didn't, then it's probably the buyer's place of business. So next slide, please. So Article 42.2, again, the highlighted bits are the bits that matter. So obligation of the seller, and this is an exemption to the obligations of the seller. And this is where either the buyer knew uh, at the time or uh, they provided some goods. So if we can go on to the next slide. 
in a nutshell, what the third limitation is about is, did the buyer know what the seller knew? Because if they did, then that's an express uh, exemption to that uh, warranty and that liability. Uh, secondly, uh, did the right or claim, is it in relation to something that the buyer was responsible for? And look at this case of the Israeli shoes. Uh, uh, it'll give you an idea. So in other words, if the buyer uh, is whatever they provided uh, to the seller to make something or to provide something, which was a final good that was sold to the buyer, if the infringement relates to that aspect of the contract, then it surely would not be fair uh, for the seller to be responsible. And again, it's a third limitation to the seller's warranty. So the next slide, please. Again, a visual interpretation of the third limitation is, can the seller point to the buyer for the fault? Uh, and if they can, then they're probably going to be okay. So uh, the next slide, please. So finally, just general considerations. Uh, one is the burden of proof. Well, whose burden of proof do you think it might be? And the standard of proof. Um, again, these are probably considerations that I, as an English lawyer, am more concerned about than potentially civil lawyers, uh, certainly on the standard of proof. And the burden of proof can be a little bit more uh, movable than perhaps um, we would have in English law, where he who asserts must prove. Um, the second point you need to uh, consider is the interpretation of Articles 41, 42, and 43 will be subject to the earlier articles and the earlier uh, uh, impositions. So things like the duty of good faith uh, in international contracts imposed by Article 7. Secondly, the point about no parole evidence rule. You can go beyond the words of the contract. You can go and look at other communications. So, you know, one general piece of advice, which I hope Stefan will not scold me for, is read every page of the bundle because there might be some nuggets in there and no doubt there will be. So um, you can use all that stuff under the CISG, which of course you wouldn't be able to under English law. And finally, uh, no written requirement. So is there anything in the uh, witness statements which might not be within a document itself, but any oral evidence which is contested. And then look at what the remedies are that are available. Are they adequate? Because in certain circumstances, of course, um, these things, uh, Article 42, um, it's predominantly, I get the impression, it was foreseen that it was to argue potentially registered uh, IP rights or industrial rights. But the, there's a whole host of non-registrable or non-registered IP rights, which which may throw a different uh, uh, light on, on the situation, and especially in respect of the available knowledge uh, and available information in the public sphere, and of course, uh, who, who has the power balance in terms of information. And then just have a quick look at the CD Media case, uh, which is uh, one of the leading authorities on Article 42. Okay, next slide. So there we are. That's the end. I've been short and sweet and hopefully fast, fast, Ferrari fast. Uh, and that leaves a little bit of time uh, for all your questions. Uh, thank you very much again. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much. And we do have a host of questions. And I think at the end, we have a question which kind of com links the CISG to the trend, um, to the COVID-19 arbitration question. So can I just, when we start with the CISG questions, and can I just ask, because we have quite a number, to be relatively short in answering them, please, that we can get through this. So the um, first question, Claudio, is how much is considered preponderant normally? Is it a 50% plus? And how, to, how do you measure which part of the contract makes a preponderant pass? Uh, yeah, it's open. Uh, I myself like the 50% criteria on price. It's, it's very easy to work. But it's 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 not always suitable, mostly because of what we just said that uh, sometimes the essential is the operative word other than the substantive. Uh, it's 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 actually on a case by case basis. I I have I mean, seventeen years on, 
with the mood, and, and I don't have a definitive question, uh, def definitive answer to that question. Uh, uh, if if you have the pricing, the cost for each part of uh, the obligation, it makes your life a lot easier. Sometimes you have uh, an essential uh, part of the obligation uh, uh, priced at a much smaller amount, and and the number Professor Hono gives us is is fifteen percent. So it's 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 on a case by case basis. It's it's. Uh, can I, can I add a question there? Like a few years ago, there was a Swiss proposal in front of Ancetral, which was the idea to have a sister or uh, sibling convention to the CISG, especially around services. That proposal was rejected. What does it tell us in regard to Article 3? Does it mean we should be very generous and you know extend basically the definition to kind of include services as well or does it tell us to be very restrictive uh no i don't have the answer to that i what i could tell you is that i do like the vagueness of the language of of the cisg because of the evolving nature of international trade and interpretation with with the backup system of the CISG. You have you have uh, a lot of good people, Petra is an example, uh, working on the interpretation of uh, uh, each case and each situation. So if you go back uh, and either complement it or adapt the language, uh, you probably incur the error of believing that uh, time will not have an effect on, on, on your work and it will probably will have. Right. So a question for Frederico. What is the difference between the definition of a right and a claim under the CISG? And uh, what is it? I think what is it, especially what is the definition of a claim? Um, I, I'm not sure if there is a definition prescribed within the CISG, but certainly um, a, a common sense would dictate that a right is a claim in waiting. <laughs> Um, and that a claim is something that's already been issued, right? So you might want to look at uh, uh, the arbitration rules to see what a claim is and when proceedings begin. But I, I would say that a claim could be said to be either the claim itself once it's formalized or at least a proper assertion of uh, 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 the right. Um, and again, different legal systems may, may interpret that uh, differently, but... Um, to me, a, a bare right uh, is not something that would necessarily uh, uh, trigger Article 42, except for the fact that it's actually prescribed quite expressly there as a right or claim. So what the definition of a right is exactly um, is something I think that we have to keep an eye out for um, the case law as it evolves to see how different jurisdictions may, A, make that distinction and B, um, uh, 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 narrow that down. But to me, a right or a claim seems pretty narrow to me, uh, sorry, pretty wide to me, and, and opens the scope up. That's the best non-answer I can give. <laughs> Thank you. And I think the last question gets, get, goes to uh, Manuel, um, and that is, what do you suppose is a balance between the right to be heard and nowadays force, force majeure? Um, which also previously linked, you know, how does it work if we have force majeure under the CISJ? Does that have an impact on the right to be heard? Right. Well, there, there, there should not be a confusion uh, between uh, the defenses that you may have regarding the actual claim, the substantive claim, the the inability to perform because of, of a force majeure, because of an impediment before the, beyond the party's control, and the, the actual way how you assert those rights in a, in a hearing or in an arbitration proceeding. It, there could, it could be that the, that the same facts, that the same circumstance affecting the parties uh, prevents the party from performing the contract. That's the first major uh, that you know that that we've been talking. That, you know that others have been talking about, and and the ones that you would confront in a in a in a in a 
in a case uh, where the breach of, a, of, you know, of the actual contract and the inability of the party to present their case. So there might be a relationship in the sense that the underlying facts of the party is prevented because there was a major accident uh, and the party could not perform the contract and obviously they cannot attend the hearings. Uh, you would have that, but, but, the, but that distinction has to be made. The, what's important from the procedural standpoint on the, on, the, on the party's ability to present their case is that any proceeding, it doesn't matter if it's oral, if it's written, it has to pre it has to give the parties equal treatment. By the way, there are legal systems that don't talk about both parties being equally treated, but that the differences have to be acknowledged, and that the positions have to be uh, have to be considered. And so, so it's basically a watered down right to to be treated equally. But the 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 right to be treated equally or the right to present one's case is something that, that speaks to the ability to defend the, the, the actual case. Thank you very in much. A and I think I will hand over I now to the Camilla and the organizers, uh, because we have come, I think, to the end of the webinar.